Hello everyone uh, and welcome once again to our programming languages course. Uh, in this lecture we're going to talk about the object-oriented paradigm. And this is in uh, basically in two sections. First we'll uh, recall the notion of abstract data types and, and uh, talk about the limits regarding that uh, regarding the abstract data types. And then that will lead us to the fundamental concept in object-oriented languages. So let's recall our definition of the abstract data type. Uh, we can summarize it by saying that abstract data types are a mechanism that guarantees the encapsulation and hiding of information in a clean and efficient manner. And remember when we were talking about abstract data types, we defined these two uh, terms, encapsulation and information hiding. So encapsul encapsulation uh, allows us to unite in a single construct both data and the methods for legally manipulating it. So we encapsulate it or we encapsulate the data and the methods to manipulate the data inside some kind of a capsule and that's encapsulation. Now the second thing was uh, information hiding uh, and by using information hiding we prevent certain aspects of a software component from being accessible to its clients. And re remember that's one of the important things uh, regarding abstract data types that we're able to separate the interface uh, from the implementation so we're able to hide the implementation details from the clients. So uh, aren't abstract data types just perfect? Is there is there some problem with them? Well the main problem is inflexibility and this inflexibility shows up when we want to extend or reuse an abstraction. And we'll, we'll uh, talk about this in, the, in, the, in this lecture. So let's uh, give an example here. We have an abstract data type called counter. Remember this is in our pseudo language. So let's assume that we have a keyword here, apps type, and the name of the abstract data type is counter. Now the counter is actually implemented as an integer. Uh, on the signature side, which is really the interface side, we have three functions, reset to reset the counter, get to get the value, and inc to increment the counter. And then on the operation side, which is really the implementation side, we have the, uh, the, uh, the implementation of the, uh, of the functions. Resets just sets the counter to zero. Get just simply returns the counter and increments just increments it by one. So if we just uh, we look at this in, in, in C++, remember this, what I shown here is just a uh, pseudo language, but this can easily be implemented in C++. And notice since I'm implementing an abstract data type here and we are not really talking about classes yet, I'm just implementing it in, in, inside C++ as if, as if I was writing C. So if we look at the counter uh, H file, I just type def the counter. So int is the, is the known type and counter is the new type. So counter is just of type int. And then I clear three functions reset get and inc reset get and increment and so the h file which is the header file is really the interface this is the interface for for the client the client that is going to use my abstract data type now in counter.cpp i have the implementation which should not be visible to the user and this is really just the implementation that we saw on the slides earlier. Uh, set the counter to zero, return the counter, and increment the counter by one. And then in the main file, 
the main file is really the client. It uh, declares a counter. C is of type counter. And then I'm using some of the functions. Uh, I reset the counter. I increment it. And I get the value. So reset will set it to zero. Increment it twice will basically means that I increment the value to the value 2 and then finally I write out the value. So if we just run this I get the counter has value 2 which makes sense. So I'm, I'm able to implement here a very simple abstract data type basically using C. I'm not using the functionalities of C++ which are, which are classes. I'm not using any classes here. So, uh, let's now say that we want to define a counter that is enriched by some new operations. So, we have really two choices. We can define a completely new abstract data type, which is similar in many respects to the one we just defined, but has a, a, a new operations at this, uh, at this, added. The second choice that we have is to uh, somehow make use of counter to define an enriched counter. So if we look at the first uh, choice here, or the first approach, the first approach says we define a completely new abstract data type, which is similar in many respects to the one that we just defined. So now we dis uh, define a new abstract data type, uh, we call it here new counter, new counter one, and the type is now, uh, the way it's implemented, it's a struct, before it was just a just a single integer. Now it is the struct uh, where we have uh, an integer c that represents the counter, and then we have a variable that keeps track of how many times the counter has been reset. So we have int num reset is equal to zero. On the signature side, we have very similar uh, uh, functions as we had earlier. We have the reset function. Now it takes a new counter as a, as a uh, parameter. We have the get function and we have the increment function. Uh, but in addition, we have a new function, how many resets, which did, does not exist in our counter abstract data type. And in the operations, we have uh, on, in the reset operation, we set our counter x is, a, is of type new counter, x dot c is the c member of the struct, we set it to zero, and then we increment our num reset, because num reset is supposed to keep track of how many times we reset this counter. Our get function is similar to what we had earlier, now we return x dot c, which is the counter itself here, increment, we just increment it, and we have a function how many resets, which just returns how many times we have reset uh, our counter. Um, and notice, notice here that in both in this example and the original example, uh, the counter is set as a parameter to the uh, functions that manipulate it. And notice that because we're not yet discussing uh, object orientation or classes, this is just an abstract data type in some language that does not support uh, object-oriented programming. And if it does not uh, support object-oriented programming, we cannot uh, um, uh, build member functions in the true sense. We have to build functions that take the instances of the abstract data type as parameters. But we will see later how, how that, uh, that... We will see later the difference when we, when we look at the um, class examples. So we're looking at, at this uh, first uh, approach uh, where we completely uh, add uh, or define a new data type, 
which is similar in many respects to the one that we just defined and we, we just went over that. Uh, so what is the problem here? Well, this is a so, so, so first of all, this is a solution that is acceptable as far as encapsulation goes. Why is that? Well, because we're encapsulating here data, which is inside the struct here, and operations on it. So in that sense, this is a this is an abstract data type. Uh, encapsulation is fine, and information hiding is fine as well because we have functions. And if we implement this in C or C++, we could do it this exact same way as we saw here by having a separate CPP file and a separate header file. So we are, we are <coughs> making a difference, distinguishing between the interface in the, in the header file and the implementation in the, impl in the CPP file. So what is the problem? Uh, well, it's kind of obvious that we were required to redefine the operations that we already defined for a simple counter. Uh, so for, for large abstract data types, this is of course a big problem. Imagine that we had a, a very large uh, or, or a large abstract data type that we had already programmed. We had uh, implemented the the uh, functions that we use to manipulate the data and then we need some added functionality and the approach that we're taking here is just to redefine or define a new abstract data type that has all the functionality of the previous one plus some additional functionality and we had to reprogram everything so of course that's a, that's a, from a software engineering perspective that's a, that's a, a terrible situation. Uh, and also, if we would need to change the implementation of counter, what would happen? We might change. You might find some new uh, uh, way to to um, represent our counter instead of being an integer. It might be something else. And then we'll, we would need to uh, uh, change some of the uh, functionality in, in, in our implementation. And if we wanted our new co counter to, to use this new representation as well, we would need to do exactly the same thing inside our new counter. So the bottom line, we are basically duplicating work. We are, we are not able to reuse the code. So this is a this is a bad approach. Um, so what if we do the second choice? We make use of counter to define an enriched counter. So what would that mean? So instead of uh, completely re uh, defining a new uh, type, we inside our new type we use the abstract data type that has already been implemented so in our new counter 2 here we still have a struct as before but now one of the member variables inside our struct is actually an instance of our counter abstract data type so we have counter c int num reset equal to zero the signature is very similar as before we have, have of course as formal parameters, we have new counter two in our reset, in our get, in our increment. So the interface is similar. Uh, on the operation side, we have uh, uh, the code for, let's say, re if we look at first at the reset code, which is supposed to reset our counter, what do we do? Well, since counter is a part of our struct we simply call the reset function with the counter uh, type as a parameter so in this case we're actually able to use the code that has already been implemented for counter then reset just increments its own num reset uh, variable 
in the get function we do similar things we the, the get function in our abstract data type new counter 2 uh, is implemented by calling the get function for the abstract data type counter or sending uh, a, 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 tie, a value which is of the counter type in on the in the increment function we have similar functionality we just call the increment function with a former parameter of type counter and then finally how many resets is just uh, similar to the way it was originally in the, in the new counter one after data type it just returns the num reset uh, value so this solution is clearly better than the previous one uh, because we're able to uh, use some part of the code that has already been uh, implemented and that really means that the operations that do not have to be modified uh, are only called from inside new counter see we didn't modify the get function we just called get with uh, a value of type counter same for increment we just called increment for the value of type counter so instead of re-implementing it we use the code that had already been written um, that still there is one problem here that the we have to call explicitly uh, the f functions inside counter even though we are not uh, modifying anything we still explicitly have to call these functions why is that well because there is no inheritance here we are not in a uh, object oriented language here uh, we are in a language that supports abstract data types but there is no inheritance so we can't really inherit the code we have to explicitly call the underlying functions in the counter uh, type of course it would be preferable to have an automatic mechanism uh, with which to inherit the implementations of these two operations uh, from counter the get and the ink uh, 